Texas. It's a vast place. A land of contrast. We Texans have fought for our land, fought over it, gambled for it, traded it, even bought and paid for it. But regardless of how we win or lose it, we're particular about where its boundaries are. Okay, Danny, how about line? Half that back north. Good, let's shoot distance. Okay, bring it about 1,500 towards me. Distance and line are good. Set your stake right there. Okay, Danny, I've got the stake set. I'm going to start digging around it now, looking for that corner. 10-4, I'll be down there in a minute. Gary, Robbie just set that uh, stake down there at or near that rock mound we're supposed to find. Good, let's hope we can find it. We have to have it. He's down there. It uh, looks like he's scraping around right now. Found anything yet? Oh, Danny, this rock mound caused to have a live oak tree bearing north 60 east 13 bearers, and another one that bears south 55 east 20 bearers. That could be one of the trees. Robbie, get the needle and set it up so you read a bearing of north 60 degrees east to this tree. Dang, this makes some connections to this rock mound. You're observing one of the most exciting and exacting professions in the world. Surveying, Texas style. The land they're surveying originally was part of a railroad grant. Now millions of dollars worth of minerals rely upon the surveyor's ability to reconstruct imaginary lines drawn across the land over a hundred years ago. A routine assignment for Texas surveyors. Gary Phillip is contracted to buy a piece of land. Actually, it's two tracks. Like most green. surveys, this one began with a conference between Eastern the surveyor and his client. Bounded on one side by the Concho River, and there's a state highway that runs in between the tracks, and the <clears throat> westerly tract, which is about a thousand acres, is on the other side of the highway. I have the abstracts back to the sovereignty on both parcels. And uh, if we need anything else, we could probably get it from the seller. I'll have to go down to Austin at the General Land Office and start uh, farming some records. Uh, the search for old clues begins with historical research. Using a combination of state, county, and his own records, the surveyor familiarizes himself not only with the original survey work, but with all subsequent surveys. This research must be done whether the survey is of the largest ranch or the smallest city track. Like the captain of a ship, the surveyor can't chart a course without knowing where he's starting from. He seeks his starting point in old field notes, an original monument, topographic features, anything which will help orient the search. This is Mr. Goodfellow's field book that he had when he set the rock man with the bottom at the northeast corner of section 24, the H and TC railroad sections. Yes, we need to find that rock man. I want you to take this book and read it and study it to get a firm understanding of what it was Mr. Goodfellow was doing at the time he set that rock man. 
Okay, do we have his uh, field sketch of that area? We have his working sketch, and I'll get it for you. All right, thank you. The original survey of this particular section was made in 1871. The first corner marker was an X cut into a cedar tree. That tree was destroyed by lightning in the spring of 1903. The second was a boy dark post, which man may have removed. The third was an iron pin discovered by treasure hunters in 1973 and discarded. The fourth was accidentally plowed up. first principle of surveying is that the first survey was correct. Otherwise, you have no starting point. Fortunately, most early Texas surveyors were dependably accurate. The boundary marker we're now looking for was put down by a surveyor back at the turn of the century. Referring to his temporary survey points set on a previous surveying expedition, this old-timer is preparing to place a more permanent marker. He'll make the necessary notation of reference marks, bearings, witness trees, topographic observations, and anything else that would aid him or his successors in re-establishing the position of this survey as he now has it located. Once this has been done, he'll erect a stone mound to mark the spot. To help distinguish it from a naturally occurring mound, the surveyor places a man-made object, in this case, an old medicine bottle in the center of the mound and covers it with stones. Like most of the early surveyors in Texas, this man was a craftsman, so we know that the marker we're looking for was once exactly where he said it was. In spite of this, the crew failed to find the corner. Part of the problem may be the modern electronic devices they're using are just too accurate for the problem at hand. So we're gonna try to duplicate the survey using similar equipment that was available back toward the turn of the century. If this fails, the search must widen again. While they're setting up, we're going to answer some questions about the surveyors themselves. How did surveying all begin? What draws men and women into surveying? How are they trained? What does surveying mean to us today? To answer these questions, we'll have to do a bit of research work ourselves. And like any good surveyor, we know that the story must start with history. It's a history that'll take us back a few thousand years to ancient Egypt in the time of the pharaohs. The fertile crescent of the Nile furnished grain for the farmers and tax for the collector. To separate one field from another, boundaries were erected. But the Nile was fickle and frequently overflowed her banks, wiping out crops, homes, and boundaries. When the waters receded, it was difficult to find just who owned what. To solve the problem, 
Egyptians turned to the principles of mathematics, geometry, trigonometry, logic, and deduction, and created the first professional surveyors. With sighting devices and lengths of rope for measuring distance, Egyptian surveyors were so accurate that even large projects, like the Great Pyramids, are off only a small fraction of 1% on the side and corner angles. Exactness has always been vital to survey work because so much depends on it. From the earliest days, severe penalties have been prescribed for anyone who moved a boundary marker. The law of Moses pronounced a curse on anyone who moved a boundary stone. And ancient Rome punished anyone caught tampering with survey markers by death, thereby effectively cutting down on repeat offenders. Even today, moving a survey marker calls for a substantial fine. Throughout history, surveyors have been on the cutting edge of exploration, making charts and maps, laying out home and ranch sites, towns and cities, territories and states. Surveyors were held in such high esteem in colonial days that it's no wonder that both Washington and Lincoln were surveyors, as was Thomas Jefferson. Of course, long before settlers began arriving in the United States, the Spanish were opening up Texas. Since Texas and the United States grew into separate and distinct countries, and due to the complex history of Texas, we developed our own system of surveys and surveying. Most of the United States uses a grid system of surveying, utilizing English measurements, such as feet, acres, and rods. In Texas, we use a combination of meets and bounds with such terms as varas, leagues, or labors, inherited from the Spanish. We also use the U.S. geodetic system and the latest Texas coordinate systems. This enables any Texas surveyor to relate his work to a system of coordinates based on geodetic position for each of the five zones shown here. A survey, once tied to this coordinate system, can be located in subsequent years. If you look at the deed to your farm, ranch, or home site, you're likely to find some unfamiliar Spanish terms that we still use today. The basic Spanish unit of measurement is the vara, roughly equivalent to a yard. But this made for some long figures, so other terms came into play. Like labor, the amount of land a man could labor over for a farm. It was a million square varas, or about 177 acres. This is shown in comparison to a section, which is 640 acres. Next up came a league, 25 million square varas, or 4,428 acres, which was considered suitable for a ranch with cattle. Since under the Spanish land grant program, you could get a labor of land if you wanted to farm, or a league of land if you wanted to ranch, it's no wonder so many Texans became cattlemen and not a few pursued both farming and ranching. They were given a league and a labor of land. The terms remain with us today. In surveying vast tracts of Texas, early surveyors were in the field for months and frequently had to use improvised objects for monuments. One surveyor found an old iron bedstead and sawed it into chunks beautifully recording their location in his field notes. Some built rock boundary mounds and placed cans or bottles inside. Others made marks on stones or used natural wood objects, such as this pine knot. In spite of primitive conditions, however, most early surveyors were surprisingly accurate and it's not unusual to find an original boundary marker within two or three feet of where it was described to be. In olden days, some surveyors were only semi-skilled, and modern professionals following in their transit tracks are still worrying over their inaccuracies. Of course, the reverse is also true. Surveyors dead a hundred years are still being admired and praised by their successors. Yet sometimes, surveyors did make mistakes. 
Can you tell at what point the surveyor's compass went haywire? Today, surveyors have to prove themselves before they're allowed to practice. Many universities and training institutions offer surveying courses. Even with specialized training, a surveyor must work four to six years as an apprentice, then pass a comprehensive 16-hour examination covering the law as it applies to surveying, mathematics, field problems, and practical applications. This examination is given twice a year in Austin and is graded by the Texas Board of Land Surveying. After all this, a surveyor is qualified to practice in Texas, either as a member of an established firm or perhaps with a construction or oil company. He can also open his own surveying business, but such an independent venture requires spending many thousands of dollars for equipment, offices, personnel, maps, vehicles, and specialized tools. Why does anyone go through all this to become a registered public surveyor? One reason is the challenge. It's a career with all the excitement of a detective story, one with a sense of logic, history, and deduction, combined with the preciseness of geometry and mathematics. Finally, there is the knowledge that the work you're doing is vital and important. That's why you'll find surveyors everywhere, always involved in growth of industry, farming, and community development. The surveyor is on the leading edge of urban development, mapping out subdivisions, downtown areas, even airports. The survey brings order to an unmarked land and allows an orderly and logical pattern of growth to develop. Topographic surveys are necessary to provide the information developers, builders, planners, and engineers need to ascertain correct street layout, drainage, and traffic patterns, and to provide for the best utilization of the land. Surveyors do property development surveys to map progress of construction to enable builders to obtain periodic mortgage financing and to check structures for sway and settling. Surveyors also do surveys which show not only the land, but improvements as well. Every survey requires absolute accuracy. Ask a surveyor how close is close enough, and he'll tell you that nothing short of perfection is acceptable. You wouldn't want to get one of these in the wrong place. Why perfection? Well, the precise placement of this model railroad building may not be of critical importance. It's easily moved. But a full-size permanent structure? That's another story altogether. And no one who builds any kind of building wants to make a mistake about where the property line is. The surveyor can find himself in some interesting and unusual situations, in remote locations, moving by ship, or helicopter. Even out in the Gulf of Mexico, accurately marking locations for offshore oil and gas wells, pipelines, and related facilities. Reference points are transferred from known landmarks by triangulation from platform to platform offshore. So where are the survey markers in the Gulf? Some of them are up there, in the sky. Modern surveyors can use satellites to position surveys correctly, hundreds of miles from the nearest land monument. Bill, what altitude do we need that Hamilton County job on that? Uh, Hamilton's about 11,000. We need uh, about 10,500 for Terrence. Right, OK. Surveyors even use special photographic equipment to do aerial surveys accurate enough for contour and topographic maps, such as this one.
Ever wonder what happens when a boundary runs through a river or three feet off the side of a cliff or both? Well, it's pretty hard to hang a marker in thin air. Probably distance fell about 70 foot short there which will put us out in the middle of that river. If you'll set your stake there, we'll just tie it down regularly. Well, a surveyor places an offset, a reference marker that says the actual boundary is some specified bearing and distance to the north, east, south, or west. And what about hills and mountains? How are they surveyed? Do you have more acres when your land is full of mountains? The answer is no. Surveys are made as though the land were flat. A hundred acres with a mountain in the middle will contain more dirt, but it is surveyed as though it were level. Surveying has been an important part of civilization. As long as property is bought and sold, surveying will continue to be important. Hey, Danny, I think I found it. It's an interesting and rewarding profession. You never know what you might find. Looks like my crew just found the original marker very near the spot where the old surveyor's note said it would be. Of course, this is awfully hard to find. At Rock Mound, it eroded quite a bit in a hundred years, and there's a cedar bush right in the middle of it. That old surveyor would be mighty proud of himself. He'd be proud to know he was part of a legacy of professional Texas surveyors, part of our history, part of our heritage, and part of our future. So the next time you come upon a survey crew or a field party, wave. They're drawing imaginary lines from yesterday to tomorrow. They're drawing the lines of progress. Crossroads far and wide Carry on your travels Across the countryside Our history is woven From the fabric of the land We're looking toward tomorrow Proud of where we Ready to land a hand.